Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module which is Conservation Laws 3. In this module, we will have three lectures, the Environment Protection Act, the Water Act and the Air Act. So let's begin with the Environment Protection Act. As with every act, we begin by looking at the preamble. To understand why this act was made, what are the purposes that this act tries to fulfill? So, the Environment Protection Act 1986, Act number 29 of 1986, enacted on 23rd of May 1986. Now, when you look at this date 1986, it tells you that it was right after the Bhopal gas disaster. The Bhopal gas disaster happened in 1984, in the December of 1984, where large quantities of methyl isocyanate gas were released into the atmosphere by the Union Carbide factory. And in that episode, a large number of people died, a large number of people became sick and the consequences move on to this date. Now, that was an incident that shook up the conscience of the nation because before, 19, uh, before uh, this Environment Protection Act, we did not have very stringent provisions when it came to the protection of the environment and to stop the release of these noxious gases. And so the government came up with this act in 1986 by the name of the Environment Protection Act. So it says an act to provide for the protection and improvement of environment and for matters connected therewith. So the first objective is protection and improvement of environment and the matters connected therewith. Whereas decisions were taken at the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held at Stockholm in June 1972, in which India participated to take appropriate steps for the protection and improvement of human environment. So it is referring to this Stockholm Conference of 1972, in which the Prime Minister of India herself was representing India in the conference. So that is the level of importance that was given to this particular conference. And in this conference, the decisions were taken to take appropriate steps for the protection and improvement of the human environment. And uh, the acts that we are going to consider in this uh, module are uh, having a reference to this particular conference. And whereas it is considered necessary further to implement the decisions aforesaid in so far as they relate to the protection and improvement of environment and the prevention of hazards to human beings, other living creatures, plants and property. So this paragraph is saying that not only because we have taken decisions here, but also because it has become necessary to take uh, measures for the protection and improvement of the environment and the prevention of hazards to human beings. Now, this is where we are finding a slight reference to the Bhopal gas tragedy that this act is being formulated to prevent such hazards to human beings, other living creatures, plants and property. Be it enacted by parliament in the 37th year of the Republic of India as follows. So, how is this act arranged? The arrangement of section tells us that the first chapter is preliminary, short title, extent and commencement and section 2 is definitions. Now these two sections as we have seen so far in this course, they are mostly common in all the acts. Chapter 2 is general powers of the central government. Power of central government to take measures to protect and improve environment, appointment of officers and their powers and functions power to give directions, appeal to the National Green Tribunal, rules to regulate environmental pollution. So basically this chapter 2 is 
giving certain powers to the central government to protect and improve the environment and these powers will be, be wielded by certain officers. So, it provides for the appointment of these officers, it tells us about the powers and functions of these officers. Plus, it gives the central government the power to give directions to protect and improve the environment. Later on, this section 5a, appeal to the National Green Tribunal was also added. And then we have rules to regulate environmental pollution. Chapter 3 talks about prevention, control and abatement of environmental pollution. Persons carrying on industry, operations, etc. not to allow emission or discharge of environmental pollutants in excess of the standards. So, what these sections are now doing is, they are telling about what are the do's and don'ts when it comes to environment and pollution. So, persons carrying on industry, operations, etc. are not to allow emission or discharge of environmental pollutants in excess of the standards. If they do so, then it becomes an offence. So, here what we are observing is that this act is defining certain offences, it is defining certain do's and don'ts, which tells us that there are a, there are substantive provisions in this act. But at the same time, it also defines certain procedures about how things will be uh, managed and so there are also procedural aspects. So, here again we have an act that has both substantive and procedural parts. Then it talks about persons handling hazardous substances to comply with procedural safeguards, furnishing of information to authorities and agencies in certain cases, powers of entry and inspection power to take sample and procedure to be followed in connection therewith, environmental laboratories, government analysts, reports of government analysts, penalty for contravention of the provisions of the act and the rules, orders and directions. So, this act is also telling us about the penalties. So, it is defining offences and it is prescribing penalties for the contravention of those sections. Then it has a section on offences by companies and offences by government departments. Then chapter 4 talks about miscellaneous aspects, protection of action taken in good faith, cognizance of offences, information, reports or returns, members, officers and employees of the authority constituted under section 3 to be public servants, bar of jurisdiction of courts, power to delegate, effect of other laws, power to make rules and rules made under this act to be laid before the parliament. So, this is a fairly short act, it has only 26 sections and a few additions. So, it is it is fairly a short and simple act, but the provisions that we as we will see are fairly um, stringent. So, let us now look at these sections in detail. Chapter 1 preliminary. Section 1, short title, extent and commencement. So, what is the title of the act? It is the Environment Protection Act 1986. Where does it extend to? It extends to the whole of India. When does it uh, commence? It shall come into force on such date as the central government may by notification in the official gazette appoint and different dates may be appointed for different provisions of this act and for different areas. And the, the central government in act, uh, released this notification on 19th of, uh, on uh, 12th of November 1986 and it said that this act will come into force from this date, 19th of November 1986. So, this is the date of commencement of this act. Now, this act gave this power to the central government to notify this date and it also mentions that different dates may be appointed for different provisions of this act and for different areas. So, if needed, the central government has the power to say that such and such sections will be applicable from such and such dates or such and such sections shall be applicable uh, from such and such dates to such and such areas. So, it is not necessary that the central government should enact the act in one go or commence this act in one go. They have the power to uh, to change the dates of commencement. Now, section 2 talks about definitions. 
in this act unless the context otherwise requires. Environment includes water, air and land and the interrelationship which exists among and between water, air and land and human beings, other living creatures, plants, microorganism and property. So, environment includes all of these, but it can also include something else. So, it is an inclusive definition. Environmental pollutant means any solid, liquid or gaseous substance present in such concentration as may be or tend to be injurious to the environment. So, when we talk about environmental pollutant, then it only includes solid, liquid or gaseous substances. We are not including things like light, we are not including things like sound. Environmental pollution means the presence in the environment of any environmental pollutant. Handling in relation to any substance means the manufacture, processing, treatment, package, storage, transportation, use, collection, destruction, conversion, offering for sale, transfer or the like of such substance. So, when we talk about handling a substance, it includes any of these and the definition says it means these things. However, you will find that it says means, but then it says or the like. So, or the like means that this again becomes an inclusive definition. So, it includes all of these things, but it can also include similar other things. Hazardous substance means any substance or preparation which by reason of its chemical or physicochemical properties or handling is liable to cause harm to human beings, other living creatures, plants, microorganism, property or the environment. So, that is a hazardous substance. It is any substance or preparation. So, preparation means that you can have a combination of substances which by reason of its chemical or physico-chemical properties or handling. So, it is hazardous because of its chemical nature, it is hazardous because of its physico-chemical nature. So, for example, something can be dense and because of its density, it uh, settles near the ground. So, that makes it hazardous. If it were of a lesser density, probably it would have moved away with the wind. So, that becomes a physico a physical property. So, something can be hazardous merely because of its chemical properties or chemical properties in combination with physical properties or something can become hazardous when it is being handled because handling includes things like uh, storage, transportation, collection, destruction, conversion. So, during these processes as well, something can become hazardous and is liable to cause harm to human beings other living creatures, plants, microorganism, property or the environment, then it becomes a hazardous substance. Occupier in relation to any factory or premises means a person who has control over the affairs of the factory or the premises and includes in relation to any substance, the person in possession of the substance. So, when we say somebody is occupying a factory or premises, it means that that person has control over the affairs of the factory or the premises. So, it when we say that the occupier will be held liable, it does not mean that the occupier must physically be present in that area. It is also possible that the occupier is sitting somewhere else, but is having power to control things in that area. So, this is what these words are saying. A person who has control over the affairs of the factory or the premises. But it also includes in relation to any substance, the person in position of the substance. So, that person is also dealt with by this word occupier. And prescribed means prescribed by rules made under this act. So, these are the definitions. Then chapter 2 deals with general powers of the central government. So, section 3 says power of central government to take measures to protect and improve environment. Subject to the provisions of this act, the central government shall have the power to take all measures as it deems necessary or expedient for the purpose of protecting and improving the quality of environment and preventing, controlling and abating environmental pollution. 
Abating means reducing. So, this section is giving powers to the central government to take measures as it deems fit so that the environment is protected and any environmental pollution is prevented or if it were not prevented, if it has already happened, then it, it gets controlled. So, for instance, the government is able to confine it to a, a certain area, it is able to, uh, to avoid the spread or abate, that is reduce the environmental pollution. So, this section is giving all these powers to the central government. In particular and without prejudice to the generality of the provisions of subsection 1, such measures may include measures with respect to all or any of the following matters namely. So, this subsection 2 is now saying that we are not reducing the, the generality of subsection 1, but we are specifying that these things in particular can be done. Things like coordination of actions by the state governments, officers and other authorities under this act or the rules made there under or under any other law for the time being in force which is relatable to the objects of this act. Laying down standards for the quality of environment in its various aspects, planning and execution of a nationwide program for the prevention, control and abatement of environmental pollution, laying down standards for emission or discharge of environmental pollutants from various sources whatsoever. So, this subsection is now specifying that we are not reducing the generality, but these are certain things as examples that can be done by the central government. So, by specifying all of these things, it reduces the chances that somebody might go to the court and say that the, the central government did not have such and such powers. So, it is clearly defining that okay, these powers are there. But at the same time, because of subsection 1, there are also certain other general provisions. Provided that different standards for emission or discharge may be laid down under this clause from different sources having regard to the quality or composition of the emission or discharge of environmental pollutants from such sources. Restriction of areas in which any industries, operations or processes or class of industries, operations or processes shall not be carried out or shall be carried out subject to certain safeguards. Now, why do we have to restrict these areas or why do we have to allow certain things in certain specific areas? Now, this also has its uh, linkages with the Bhopal gas tragedy. So, what had happened during the Bhopal gas tragedy was the this company Union Carbide, it had set up its plant in an area that had a large number of slums. So, there were certain slums that were already pre-existing and there were certain other areas where slums grew up with time. And so, there were a large number of people, numerous people who were living in very close vicinity to the Union Carbide factory. And because of that, when there was the release of the methyl isocyanate gas, quite a large number of people got affected. Now, to avoid a recurrence of similar tragedies, it, this act is saying that the central government may make rules for the restriction of areas in which any industries, operations or processes or classes of industries, operations of, or processes shall not be carried out or shall be carried out subject to certain safeguards. So, we can specify that such and such industries should be set up here or should not be set up in these locations. Laying down procedures and safeguards for the prevention of accidents which may cause environmental pollution and remedial measures for such accidents. Now, this again has linkages with the Bhopal gas disaster because in that particular instance, a large number of safeguards that should have been there like keeping the the methyl isocyanate gas at a very low temperature or use of flare towers or use of scrubbers or use of alarms, all of these things were shut down just to save money by the company. Now, this particular section is saying that the central government can lay down procedures and safeguards for the prevention of accidents which may cause environmental pollution and remedial measures for such accidents. So, this again is a, a power that has been vested with the central government. 
laying down procedures and safeguards for the handling of hazardous substances, examination of such manufacturing processes, materials and substances as are likely to cause environmental pollution, carrying out and sponsoring investigations and research relating to problems of environmental pollution, inspection of any premises, plant, equipment, machinery, manufacturing or other processes, materials or substances and giving by order of such directions to such authorities, officers or persons as it may consider necessary to take steps for the prevention, control and abatement of environmental pollution, establishment or recognition of environmental laboratories and institutes to carry out the functions entrusted to such environmental laboratories and institutes under the act. So, we have seen before that quite a large number of sections also deal with things like environmental laboratories. Now, this section is giving the powers to the central government to establish and recognize environmental laboratories and institutes. Because if there is a pollutant that has been released into the environment, then we must know what kind of pollutant is that, what are the levels of that pollutant and for that we need to perform certain analysis. And so, this section is saying that the central government is empowered to set up to set up these laboratories or institutes or to recognize them. Then collection and dissemination of information in respect of matters relating to environmental pollution. Preparation of manuals, codes or guides relating to the prevention, control and abatement of environmental pollution. Such other matters as the central government deems necessary or expedient for the purpose of securing the effective implementation of the provisions of this act. So, this is a fairly broad power that has been given. The central government may if it considers it necessary or expedient to do so for the purposes of this act by order published in the official gazette constitute an authority or authorities by such name or names as may be specified in the order for the purpose of exercising and performing such of the powers and functions including the power to issue directions under section 5 of the central government under this act and for taking measures with respect to such of the matters referred to in subsection 2 as may be mentioned in the order and subject to the supervision and control of the central government. So, this subsection is saying that the central government can constitute authorities to perform certain functions. So, it is not necessary that the central government should be doing everything, it can set up different authorities. Then section 4 talks about appointment of officers and their powers and functions. So, without prejudice to the provisions of subsection 3 of, sub, of section 3, the central government may appoint officers with such designations as it thinks fit for the purposes of this act and may entrust to them such of the powers and functions under this act as it may deem fit. So, the central government can not just create authorities, it can also create or appoint officers with such designations as it thinks fit. The officers appointed under subsection 1 shall be subject to the general control and direction of the central government or if so directed by that government also of the authority or authorities if any constituted under subsection 3 of section 3 or of any other authority or officer. So, the, this is now talking about the procedural regulations. Then section 5 gives the power to give directions notwithstanding anything contained in any other law, but subject to the provisions of this act, the central government may in the exercise of its powers and performance of its functions under this act, issue directions in writing to any person, officer or any authority and such person, officer or authority shall be bound to comply with such directions. So, the central government can give directions not only to the authority and the officers, but also to any person. And if the central government is giving any such directions, then the person, officer or authority is bound to comply. And then it explains, for the avoidance of doubts, it is hereby declared that the power to issue directions under this section includes the power to direct the closure, prohibition or regulation of any industry, operation or process. And the stoppage or regulation of the supply of electricity or water or any other service. So, what this explanation is saying is when the central government is 
giving directions in writing to any person, then this direction includes things like closing of the industry operation or process. So, the central government can say that okay, such and such industry is releasing such and such amount of pollutants which are harmful and so this industry should be closed from this effect, from this day. And this is a power that is vested in the central government under section 5. So, it can ask for the closure of industry operation or process. It can prohibit or regulate any industry operation or process. And it can also stop or regulate the supply of electricity or water or any other service. So, for example, if this person is not following these directions, the central government can say that, okay, cut off electricity, cut off water, cut off other services so that this industry closes. So, this is a fairly strong power with the central government. Then section 5a was added later on, appeal to the National Green Tribunal. Any person aggrieved by any directions issued under section 5 on or after the commencement of the National Green Tribunal Act 2010 may file an appeal to the National Green Tribunal established under section 3 of the National Green Tribunal Act 2010 in accordance with the provisions of that act. So, if somebody is, uh, is feeling aggrieved because of uh, a direction that he or she has received under section 5, then who can this person uh, appeal to? The answer is the National Green Tribunal. Then section 6 talks about rules to regulate environmental pollution. The central government may, by notification in the official gazette, make rules in respect of all or any of the matters referred to in section 3. In particular and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing power, such rules may provide for all or any of the following matters, namely standard of quality of air, water or soil for various areas and purposes, maximum allowable limits of concentration of various environmental pollutants including noise for different areas. Now, we had seen in the context of the definitions that noise was not there because it was only talking about the chemical substances and the physical substances. Now, in this case, this particular subsection is saying the, uh, the maximum allowable limits of concentration of various environmental pollutants including noise for this particular aspect. The procedures and safeguards for handling of hazardous substances. The prohibition and restrictions on the handling of hazardous substances in different areas. The prohibition and restrictions on the location of industries and the carrying out of processes and operations in different areas and the procedures and safeguards for the prevention of accidents which may cause environmental pollution and for providing for remedial measures for such accidents. Then chapter 3 talks about prevention, control and abatement of environmental pollution. Persons carrying on industry, operation, etc. not to allow emission or discharge of environmental pollutants in excess of the standards. Now, in this particular section, we are observing that an offence is being defined because it is giving a duty to the person. Persons who are carrying on industry, operation, etc., they are duty bound not to allow emission or discharge of environmental pollutants in excess of the standards. And if they do not discharge this duty, then it will become an offence. As we have seen before, duty and offences are very closely related. So, no person carrying on any industry, operation or process shall discharge or emit or permit to be discharged or emitted. So, when we say permit to be, it means that the person has to take all safeguards to ensure that these pollutants are not discharged or emitted in excess of such standards as may be prescribed. Persons handling hazardous substances to comply with procedural safeguards. And this has become very important in today's time of e-waste. Because when we, when we are using electronic devices, a large number of those devices contain many heavy elements. And those are very persistent environmental pollutants. Now, when the life of an electronic device is over, you throw it out, you give it for recycling, you give it for waste management 
and in all of these stages there is a chance that certain amount of these pollutants may come out and start to pollute the environment and this section is saying that the persons who are handling the hazardous substances they also have to comply with procedural safeguards meaning that if you have thrown out an, el an electronic a used electronic device into the trash then the persons who are handling that trash they have to comply with procedural safeguards if you have given it up for recycling then the persons who are handling the recycling operations they have to comply with the procedural safeguards and things like that so anybody who is handling these hazardous substances has to comply with procedural safeguards no person shall handle or cause to be handled any hazardous substance except in accordance with such procedure and after complying with such safeguards as may be prescribed so that the pollutants do not leak out furnishing of information to authorities and agencies in certain cases where the discharge of any environmental pollutant in excess of the prescribed standards occurs or is apprehended to occur due to any accident or other unforeseen act or event the person responsible for such discharge and the person in, in charge of the place at which such discharge occurs or is apprehended to occur shall be bound to prevent or mitigate the environmental pollution caused as a result of such discharge and shall also forthwith intimate the fact of such occurrence or apprehension of such occurrence and be bound if called upon to render all assistance to such authorities or agencies as may be prescribed now this portion again has links to the bhopal gas disaster because when methyl isocyanate got leaked into the air the company union carbide it did not issue any notifications it did not inform any authorities and more importantly when patients started coming into the gandhi medical college and when the doctors they were at a loss to know what what is causing these symptoms to to these patients because they had never heard of methyl isocyanate the company also did not tell them what is the antidote for this poison now this section is now making it a duty of all these persons to intimate the fact of occurrence or even the apprehension of such occurrence so even if you think that a pollutant is going to be released in some time you are duty bound to furnish information to authorities and agencies you are also bound to render all assistance to such authorities or agencies as may be prescribed so you have to tell about the antidotes you have to tell about uh, the properties of the pollutant so that uh, the authorities are able to take uh, the requisite steps on receipt of information with respect to the fact or apprehension of any occurrence of the nature referred to in subsection 1 whether through intimation under that subsection or otherwise the authorities or agencies referred to in subsection 1 shall as early as practicable cause such remedial measures to be taken as are necessary to prevent or mitigate the environmental pollution and the expenses if any incurred by any authority or agency with respect to the remedial measures referred to in subsection 2 together with interest at such reasonable rate at, as the government may by order fix from the date when a demand for expenses is made until it is paid may be recovered by such authority or agency from the person concerned as arrears of land revenue or of public demand so when we talk about pollution there is a principle that is known as the polluter pays principle so if there is an industry that has led to a a pollutant coming out into the environment it has led to an environmental pollution then that industry has to be made responsible for all of the control cleaning up and abatement measures now this particular subsection is saying that the authority or the government is going to take all steps we are not going to wait for that industry to uh, kick in and to uh, Uh, and to safeguard the the people but the government is also duty bound so the officers the authorities are also duty bound they'll start working and any money that is spent on these operations it will be recovered from the industry that had given rise to this pollutant and this money will be recovered with interest then section 10 talks about powers of entry and inspection 
subject to the provisions of this section any person empowered by the central government in this behalf shall have a right to enter at all reasonable times with such assistance as he considered necessary any place for the purpose of performing any of the functions of the central government entrusted to him for the purpose of determining whether and if so in what manner any such functions are to be performed or whether any provisions of this act or the rules made there under or any notice order direction or authorization served made given or granted under this act is being or has been complied with for the purpose of examining and testing any equipment industrial plant record register document or any other material object or for conducting a search of any building in which he has reason to believe that an offence under this act or the rules made there under has been or is being or is about to be committed and for seizing any such equipment industrial plant record register document or other material object if he has reasons to believe that it may furnish evidence for the commission of an offence punishable under this act or the rules made there under or that such seizure is necessary to prevent or mitigate environmental pollution so basically what this particular section is saying is that it is not just enough to issue directions it's not just enough to say that okay these are the safety mechanisms that need to be followed you also have to check those you also have to enter into industries and see if those safeguards are actually being followed or not you need to take samples you need to check the records you need to take appropriate steps so that the pollutant does not spread and this section section 10 is giving all these powers to the officers and the and authorities that they can enter into any of these premises they can check everything they can take samples then subsection 2 says every person carrying on any industry operation or process or handling any hazardous substance shall be bound to render all assistance to the person empowered by the central government under subsection 1 for carrying out the functions under that subsection and if he fails to do so without any reasonable cause or excuse he shall be guilty of an offence under this act so here again we are seeing that there is an offence that has been created a duty has been given to the person who is carrying out industry operation or process or handling these substances he or she is duty bound to render all assistance to this person who has come to inspect and if he or she does not do that then he or she will be guilty of an offence under this act if any person willfully delays or obstructs any person empowered by the central government under subsection 1 in the performance of his functions he shall be guilty of an offence under this act the provisions of the crpc or in relation to the state of jammu and kashmir or any area in which that code is not in force now this portion does not apply today because now crpc is applicable there as well the provisions of any corresponding law in force in that state or area shall so far as may be apply to such uh, to any search or seizure under this section as they apply to any search or seizure made under the authority of a warrant issued under section 94 of the said code or as the case may be under the corresponding provision of the said law so this subsection is saying that what is the procedure that will be followed during the search and seizure the crpc will be followed then section 11 talks about power to take sample and procedure to be followed so the central government or any officer empowered by it in this behalf shall have power to take for the purpose of analysis samples of air water soil or other substance from any factory premises or other place in such manner as may be prescribed the results of any analysis of a sample taken under subsection 1 shall not be admissible in evidence in any legal proceeding unless the provisions of subsections 3 and 4 are complied with so it is saying that the officer may take samples for the purpose of analysis but these samples will only be used as evidence in legal proceedings if subsections 3 and 4 are followed otherwise not so what are these subsections subject to the provisions of subsection 4 the person taking the sample under subsection 1 shall serve on the occupier or his agent or person in charge of the place a notice 
देर एंड देयर इन सच फॉर्म एज मे बी प्रिस्क्राइब ऑफ एज इंटेंशन टू हैव इट सो एनालाइज so why do we have this provision because we have seen that in the case of natural justice you have to follow certain procedures and one of these procedures says that you need to give a prior intimation to the person so if you have come into the factory to take samples you need to uh, you need to tell the the person who is occupying the factory or is managing the factory that yes i have come to take such and such samples so you have to serve a notice in the presence of the occupier or his agent or person collect a sample for analysis because the occupier or agent or his agent or person should not later say that no this sample was not collected at our factory it was collected from somewhere else and this is a planted evidence so it has to be taken in the presence of the occupier or his agent or person cause the sample to be placed in a container or, or containers which shall be marked and sealed and shall also be signed both by the person taking the sample and the occupier or his agent or person so these are all different procedural safeguards so it has to be kept in containers marked sealed and signed by both the officer or the person who is taking the sample and the occupier or his or her representative send without delay the container or the containers to the laboratory established or recognized by the central government under section 12 now there are also circumstances where the the person who is occupying the premises does not sign so what happens then so subsection 4 says when a sample is taken for analysis under subsection 1 and the person taking the sample serves on the occupier or his agent or person a notice under clause a of subsection 3 then in a case where the occupier his agent or person willfully absents himself the person taking the sample shall collect the sample for analysis to be placed in a container or containers which shall be marked and sealed and shall also be signed by the person taking the sample so if the occupier and his or her representatives willfully absent themselves then the officer is authorized to take the samples unilaterally and in a case where the occupier or his agent or person present at the time of taking the sample refuses to sign the marked and sealed container or containers of the sample as required under clause c of subsection 3 the marked and sealed container or containers shall be signed by the person taking the samples and the container or containers shall be sent without delay by the person taking the sample for analysis to the laboratory established or recognized under section 12 and such person shall inform the government analyst appointed or recognized under section 13 in writing about the willful absence of the occupier or his agent or person or as a case may be his refusal to sign the container or containers so while the other party is given an opportunity to uh, to be present there and to sign to ensure that the sample is not uh, a planted evidence but if somebody does not come there or refuses to sign then the officer can uh, sign it himself send it for analysis and report it to the government then section 12 talks about environmental laboratories the central government may by not by notification in the official gazette establish one or more environmental laboratories recognize one or more laboratories or institutes as, as environmental laboratories to carry out the functions entrusted to an environmental laboratory under this act so the government can establish or can recognize the central government may by notification in the official gazette make rules specifying the functions of the environmental laboratory the procedure for submission to the said laboratory of samples of air water soil or other substance for analysis or test the form of laboratory re report thereon and the fees payable for such report and such other matters as may be necessary or expedient to enable that laboratory to carry out its functions then section 13 talks about government analysis the central government may by notification in the official gazette appoint or recognize here again you have the power of appointment and recognition such persons as it thinks fit and having the prescribed qualifications to be government analyst for the purpose of analysis of samples of air water soil or other substance sent for analysis 
to any environmental laboratory established or recognized under subsection 1 of section 12. Then reports of government analysts, any document purporting to be a report signed by a government analyst may be used as evidence of the facts stated therein in any proceeding under this act. So, it makes this report of the government analyst an evidence. So, it can be used as an evidence in any proceeding under this act. Then section 15 says penalty for contravention of the provisions of the act and the rules, orders and directions. So, we have defined the offences. Now, what are the penalties? Whoever fails to comply with or contravenes any of the provisions of this act or the rules made or orders or directions issued thereunder shall in respect of each such failure or contravention be punishable with an imprisonment for a term which may extend to 5 years or with fine which may extend to 1 lakh rupees or with both and in case the failure or contravention continues with additional fine which may extend to 5000 rupees for every day during which such failure or contravention continues after the conviction for the first such failure or contravention. So, it is a very simple penalty just says 1 lakh rupees and 5 years and if the person still goes on then 5000 rupees every day. If the failure or contravention referred to in subsection 1 continues beyond a period of 1 year after the date of conviction, the offender shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 7 years. Then section 16 talks about offences by companies, where any offence under this act has been committed by a company. Every person who at the time of the offence was committed was directly in charge of and was responsible to the company for the conduct of the business of the company as well as the company shall be deemed guilty. So, the person in charge is guilty and the company also is guilty because the company is a legal person. So, the company can also be sued and shall be liable to be proceeded against and punished accordingly provided that nothing contained in this subsection shall render any such person liable to any punishment provided in this act if he proves that the offence was committed without his knowledge or that he exercised all due diligence to prevent the commission of such offence. So, in those cases, the person will be let free. Notwithstanding anything contained in subsection 1, where an offence under this act has been committed by a company and it is proved that the offence has been com committed with the consent or connivance of or is attributable to any neglect on the part of any director, manager, secretary or other officer of the company, such director, manager, secretary or other officer shall also be deemed to be guilty of that offence and shall be liable to be proceeded against and punished accordingly. So, not just the, the company and its head, but any other person who was also involved in the offence, that person shall also be proceeded against and punished. Explanation for the purpose of this section. Company means any body corporate and includes a firm or other association of individuals and director in relation to a firm means a partner in the firm. So, this is about the offences by the companies, but then you can also have offences by government departments and similar to as in the case of the company, in the case of government departments, the head of the department shall be deemed to be guilty. Now, here as well, if the head is able to prove that the offence was committed without his knowledge and he exercised all due diligence to prevent the commission of such offence, then the person will be let go. And if it is, uh, if any other officer other than the HOD is also involved, then that person will also be proceeded against and punished. Then chapter 4 talks about miscellaneous provisions, protection of action taken in good faith. No suit, prosecution or other legal proceeding shall lie against the government or any officer or other employee of the government or any authority constituted under this act or any member, officer or other employee of such authority in respect of anything which is done or intended to be done in good faith in pursuance of this act or the rules made or orders or directions issued thereunder. So, this is an indemnity clause. Then we have cognizance of offences. No court shall take cognizance of any offence under this act except on a complaint made by the central government or any authority or officer authorized in this behalf by that government. So, 
who can file a suit the central government or the authority or officer authorized by the central government not the state government so only the central government or any person who has given notice of not less than 60 days in the manner prescribed of the alleged offence and of his intention to make a complaint to the central government or the authority or officer authorized as aforesaid so any person can also file a suit then section 20 talks about information reports or returns the central government may in relation to its functions under this act from time to time require any person officer state government or other authority to furnish to it or any prescribed authority or officer any reports returns statistics accounts or other information and such person officer state government or other authority shall be bound to do so so the central government can ask for information reports and returns from any person officer state government or authority and they have to submit these documents members officers and employees of the authority constituted under section 3 to be public servants as per the meaning of section 21 of the ipc so all these members of the authorities they are public servants then section 22 is bar of jurisdiction no civil court shall have jurisdiction to entertain any suit or proceeding in respect of anything done action taken or order or direction issued by the central government or any other authority or officer in pursuance of any power conferred by or in relation to its or his functions under this act so it bars the jurisdiction of civil courts then power to delegate without prejudice to the provisions of subsection 3 of section 3 the central government may by notification in the official gazette delegate subject to such conditions and limitations as may be specified in the notification such of its powers and functions under this act except the power to constitute an authority under subsection 3 of section 3 and to make rules under section 25 as it may deem necessary or expedient to any officer state government or other authority so there is a power of de- of delegation and the central government can delegate powers except these two powers powers to constitute authority and power to make rules except these two all the other functions and powers can be delegated to any officer state government or any authority then section 24 talks about effect of other laws subject to the provisions of subsection 2 which means that where any act or omission constitutes an offence punishable under this act and also under any other act then the offender found guilty of such offence shall be liable to be punished under the other act and not under this act meaning that if the same offence is an offence under the environmental protection act and certain other act so in that case the punishment will be done as per the other act now this is an exception but apart from this or subject to the provisions of this subsection the provisions of this act and the rules or order made therein shall have effect not it with standing anything inconsistent there with contained in any enactment other than this act so taking care of this the uh, uh, the sections of this act are going to have a role then section 25 says power to make rules the central government may by notification in the official gazette make rules for carrying out the purposes of this act in particular and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing power such rules may provide for all or any of the following matters so the central government can make rules this is one power that cannot be delegated and without prejudice to the generality of this subsection here are certain rules that the central government can make the standards in excess of which environmental pollutants shall not be discharged or emitted under section 7 the procedure in accordance with and safeguards in compliance with which hazardous substances shall be handled or cause to be handled under section 8 the authorities or agencies to which intimation of the fact of occurrence or apprehension of occurrence of the discharge or of any environmental pollutant in excess of the prescribed standards shall be given and to whom all assistance shall be bound to be rendered under subsection 1 of section 9 so who do you have to inform the manner in which samples of air water soil or other substance for the purpose of analysis shall be taken 
under subsection 1 of 11. The form in which notice of intention to have a sample analyzed shall be served under clause A of subsection 3 of section 11. The functions of the environmental laboratories, the procedure for the submission to such laboratories of samples of air, water, soil or the other substances for analysis or test, the form of laboratory report, the fees payable for such report and other matters to enable such laboratories to carry out their functions under subsection 2 of section 12, the qualifications of government analyst appointed or recognized for the purpose of analysis of samples of air, water, soil or other substances. The manner in which notice of the offence and of the intention to make a complaint to the central government shall be given. The authority or officer to whom any reports, returns, statistics, accounts and other information shall be furnished under section 20 and any other matter which is required to be or may be prescribed. So this section 25 is telling that the central government has the power to make rules. And in particular, it can make all of these different rules. So, whenever we talk about any procedures in the Environmental Protection Act, whenever we are talking about anything that needs to be done, then how is that thing going to be done is something that the central government can notify in one of the rules. So, this is what section 25 is saying. Then section 26 says, rules made under this act to be laid before parliament. Every rule made under this act shall be laid as soon as may be after it is made before each house of parliament while it is in session for a total period of 30 days which may be comprised in one session or in two or more successive sessions and if before the expiry of the session immediately following the session or the successive sessions aforesaid both houses agree in making any modification in the rule or both houses agree that the rule should not be made the rule shall thereafter have effect only in such modified form or be of no effect as the case may be. So, however, that any such modification or annulment shall be without prejudice to the validity of anything previously done under that rule. So, what this section is saying is that it is talking about delegated le legislation. So, the act is giving the power to the central government to make the rules, but it is not an unbridled power. So, the central government when it makes the rules, it has to bring it to both the houses of the parliament and it has to be kept with the parliament for at least 30 days and in those 30 days, the parliament can say that no such rules should not be made or there should be such and such modifications made to those rules and those modifications have to be given effect to or if the parliament says that this rule should not be made, then it will be annulled. So, there is a big power of the parliament as well. So, in brief, when we talk about the Environmental Protection Act, it came because of the unfortunate incident of the Bhopal gas tragedy and it provides for all different mechanisms through which the pollutants can be controlled, they can be regulated, they can be checked, they can be abated and it gives responsibilities and duties to, to different persons. It establishes authorities, it gives powers to officers to take samples and other things and then it also defines what will be the penalties that will be given for different offences. So, in that way, this act also has a, a large number of substantive as well as procedural parts. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.